Let's see. How's that? Is that better? There we go. Sound. Yay! Make the voice. All right. So I right, now boom. now they can hear us. Yay! Boom. Okay, so boom. good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your time zone and latitude. <laughs> so let's start it again. So, anyways, we're gonna do something a little different tonight. We are gonna talk about the 40th anniversary of Mount St. Helens because it blew its top 40 years ago in 1980. 1980. I I was 10 years old, and I will get into pretty specific detail of what I remember of it. Um, but uh, we have Landon Curtinol, who is the, what did you say were? You're like everything. Just name, name I'm, I'm an sure again. astronomer, planetary scientist, and this being a planet, I also get to study this planet as well. And so, um, but I've had, we've had some really nice um, uh, cooperation with the, the uh, USGS uh, vol volcanology. Normally, I'm over at Kilauea, but at the 40 years ago, I was at Mount St. Helens. So let me ask you, though, before we get started, if somebody had to like, okay, because I know you have a, your hands in a lot of cookie jars. If somebody had to say, okay, what is it that you are like your main thing, what would you have to say it was? Planetary science. Really? I, I study planets, planetary formation. Um, secondarily would be um, computational number theory. Wow, I mean, it's just bizarre how much stuff you've and got. And third would be, would be with things and so forth. But but yes, but it's, 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 um, I know, I, 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 that's certainly computational number theory and primality tests and so forth is a, is a passion, but physics is also a passion, and volcanology is also a passion. And, uh, They're all kind and of so, related. You know, you know, it's so funny about the science. The nice thing about sciences is that they all seem to have a synergy with each other. Absolutely. And, and, and one thing leads to, to another. And even something like you know, so the, the, the interest in music um, and mathematics and science and sounds has has reverberations in volcanology, as we'll talk about. Well, how about this? Let me. Uh, how about I'll tell you what I remember of it, and then you can go into with the more Please. technical. And where, where where were you, and what were you remember? Tell so me. I okay. So I remember this vividly. I was at uh, a school called San Marino School, which was in uh, in Buena Park area, La Palma region, and uh, we had walked out. I'd walked outside, and uh, I was in sixth grade, I believe. Yeah, I think it was in sixth grade. Fifth or sixth grade, and uh, there was ash everywhere. There was this grayish material that was discovered. And remember, remember, I was all the way in California, right? I mean, this is Southern California, so it's quite a distance from Mount St. Helens, up in the Washington region. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was just ash everywhere. And I remember taking a sample. I remember I had a little uh, pill thing that I brought to school. I think it was like the next day, like one of those orange pill bottles. And yeah. I, I would fill it, and I filled it up with the ash. And I had that for years, and I didn't know, I, I've, I've long since lost it as a kid, but I remember something really cool about this, Landon, and you can kind of go into details as to why. But I remember it was a very, very, very fine powder, and then when you, you would take the little, you take the um, pill bottle, and you would just compactify it. You would just tap it on your hand, yeah. or tap it on a thing, and yeah. it would get, it would get much more compactified. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And it, it was, it would always trip me out because then you would just kind of shake it and it would go powder again. Yeah. It was very, and, very and, fine, and, like talcum powder. And of course, and of course, the other thing you see up here, you can't really tell because you also see this fine powder puff, right? I will, I will open this up. It's been sealed for, for 40 years. I'll open this up and it will create a bit of a mess. Well, but don't open it up. One thing it's, was, it's sealed. Don't open it. But, but, but it's, it's one thing is that, that, that it, it's, it's a, um, when, when you, if you, if I took this, and I were to have a lafayette as a margarita, but if it was empty, I'd pour this in and then pour it back. I'd find that there'd be less than half of it. Yeah, it'd be like the other half. The other half would kind of go into the air. Yeah, it would be very, very like I said, it's like a mud. Uh, Kawasa two dollars. Pinatubo. Did I say that right? Yes. Not Pinatubo. Yes. Pinatubo was an amazing volcanic eruption. I did get there post eruption. Uh, but Pinatubo was was a very significant um, BE6, uh, I believe, uh, eruption. So, okay, so tell us what happened in 1980 from what you remember. And uh... well, I mean, the, the the first real excitement started back. Um, you know, it, it was it was actually started back in 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 March. Um, and, and and Mount St. Helens had had a series of earthquakes, and then had some steam explosion out the vent, um, where they then you know closed down the area because of volcanic activity. But uh, it was on March 27th that the first 
um, ash eruption occurred. So not simply just steam. What, what was happening? Well, the magma was working its way up into, you know, into the mountain, underneath the mountain. Um, we know now is that, 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 that Mount St. Helens had two magma chambers, an upper magma chamber and a lower magma chamber. And below the lower magma chamber, um, deeper down is where the, where the uh, continental plates and, the, and the, the North American plate and continental plate friction um, is causing material, the heat from, from the through its rubbing plus the uh, mantle material that can, that can work its way up into it, was, was slowly sending material up into the lower magma chamber, which was then feeding the upper magma chamber, which then started moving up into the mountain, reaching the point of the water line, which started getting steam explosions. But on, on March 27th, was the first time we had the dusting on the top. It was a steam explosion, but it was steam explosion was dark, right? And and it indicated that magma, gases from magma were now reaching um, through cracks up to the surface. Um, so that began sort of the, the, the what they call the um, the volcanic explosion as opposed to merely steam, steam explosions. And I remember that day because uh, physics, we had, I had a physics midterm that was canceled. Right. I was going to Linville College, which was in McMainville, uh, about 90 kilometers to the to the southwest. And you know, the, the, the instructor came in and said, um, we just had a uh, ash eruption, ash fall out of Mount St. Helens. Uh, classes canceled. We're going to go up there and doing some field geology. Perfect time, because it's like, you know, you could you could study. You can study physics and prove you know what you're doing, but now is the time to go up there and do a field study. And so the process was to go up there and get ash material. Now, again, um, it had just erupted. We waited actually for the for the next ash eruption, um, and then and then because because the, the I'll explain about the, the processes of of dissolved gases and how they work. But after it went poof the second time. We, we went, landed in a helicopter, grab ash material to come back and do analysis. Um, the analysis is actually quite important because it tells you what's happening. Magma is liquid rock. Liquid rock, it, you know, it, it, if it's on the top, it's lava, we call it leaf, we call it magma. Liquid rock is just as heavy in our gravitational field as regular rock, right? And, and magma would refer to sink. Right? It doesn't. It doesn't rise up on its own. It rises up because it's got buoyant forces. What's happening? Why does magma want to reach the surface? Well, because you have inside magma. There's all kinds of. of it's a fact. Magma is a very complex chemical system, and in particular, it has a number of gases inside that, under pressure, are liquefied. They're no longer the gas. So way deep down. These gases and gases can be in the form of carbon dioxide. It can be in the form of of, of you know, hydrogen sulfide, hydrochloric acid, hydrogen fluoride. Number of gases that are dissolved in magma, even water vapor, and and way deep down, when you have this really high pressure, those gases are in liquid form. But as the magma works its way to the surface, the pressure lowers. When pressure lowers, you know from from gas chemistry. The boil, you reach what's called the boiling point, where that gas goes from liquid to vapor. All right, well, hang on. Let's talk yeah. about it real quick. Uh, I got a super chat real quick. Kwasa, sure. 5001. P.S. Remembering Mount St. Helens in memory of David A. Johnson, who was a, a surveyor, if I remember, a geological yeah. Uh, yeah. geologist. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of remember that. So in, in memory of him. Um, yeah, so let's talk about the, the, that physics real quick, if we can. Do you mind? Sure. All right, so... Sure. so as people may know, when you have some kind of liquid and you have gases in there, it's at a certain pressure. And if you go yes. to lower the pressure, those gases are going to come out of solution. Yes. Right. So if this is why if you take a, a, something that's carbonated, you take it to a higher altitude, gases are going to come out of it more. Yep. Um, so, so what happens is the magma is going to be coming up through the vents or the, these um, what, are, what, what magma chambers. Yeah. And as it does, the gases... Are going to start coming out of solution, and I guess they come out extremely rapidly. Yeah, I mean, so it's, it depends on, on, but but they, they, but it's also a a a not just straightforward. You don't all of a sudden get gas poof, mm -hmm. right? Because what you'll what you'll detect 
seismically are things called harmonic tremors. It's 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 not the rock cracking shake 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 thing. It's a it's a pulsating thing. The best way to think about about why these harmonic tremors are is if you've ever looked at a a pot of water that you're about to boil, you start to see bubbles on the surface where the high, temperature is highest connected to the to the um, to the pan that's on on the your burner. And you see those bubbles start to, 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 to form and then collapse, form and collapse, form and collapse. Well, when, when the bubble forms in the top of the magma chamber, because it's reached the boiling point, again, we think of, we think of reaching the boiling point as raising temperature, but in this case, you're lowering the pressure to where the gas comes out of solution and boils. When it, when it reaches the boiling point, the, the bubble pops open. When it pops open, it pushes against the other part of the material. Mm -hmm. And in particular, there's other bubbles there, it'll collapse those bubbles. And then the magma will push against it and the bubble will collapse. You get this browning back and forth of, of the bubble forming and, and collapsing, forming and collapsing. And that's one of the origins of this harmonic tremor. But eventually, that gas will hit the top of the magma chamber, will work its way through cracks in the rock and escape the magma chamber. And the case of uh, what happened on March 27, there was enough magmatic gases, gases from the magma that works away to the surface, that all of a sudden you got you started getting not just water, the water table hitting hot rocks and boiling, but you started getting gas from the magma mm. joining that that steam coming out and you had their first ash plume. And that's the significant sign that an eruption may be on its way. Not simply just you've got a Yellowstone or a Bumpus Hill in, in Lassen Peak, but you know, uh, last month in the park, but but something that that's on its way. Of course, you could also see the epicenters, right, of, of the stuff rising, um, as well. The other thing that happens that is that magma chambers have this turnover process. The top of the magma chamber that has the lowest pressure will start outgassing, and the gases will work way up to the rocks. And then that that what we say is that the top of that magma chamber, the the magma becomes stale. It's like you know, it's like um, you know, the, 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 the stuff that no longer is carbonated, it has, it loses its buoyancy and it begins to sink down in and it sinks down in and the, and the, and the hotter material that's still under higher pressure turns over. So the magma chamber literally has a turnover, a convection cell. The new material comes up to, um, to the, to, to the top and begins out gas again. Mm -hmm. So, so we call these deflation inflation events. Now, in the days of Mount St. Helens, in the days of Mount St. Helens, the, um, the, the, we didn't have GPS. We didn't have the kind of instrumentation or the telemetry that we could do nowadays. Um, we, we, we had, our, our, our measurements were actually relatively crude. But if we had the kind of tilt meters we have in, in Kilauea, we would have seen the mountain breathing. What do you mean by breathing? Well, let's let's take the, the, the top of the magma chamber begins to outgas. The, the magma gets stale. It begins to sink in. Well, the mag the mountain will literally sink into itself a little bit. And then and then when the when the heavy mag heavier magma or the less buoyant magma descends. The magma chamber turns over. The new magma chamber comes up to the top. Then, then that some starts coming to solution, and the magma the mountain expands. So you, the mountain literally goes through this breathing process. Now, the the expansion and contraction is really slight. It's, it's measured in fractions of microradian. Think about a one kilometer bar raised one millimeter. That is one. You know, think of like two thirds of a mile for those metrics he challenged raised up one in by the thickness of a dime. That's one microradian. So we're talking about slight, very slight, ch subtle changes you wouldn't, you wouldn't notice as a person, but instruments can, can record that stuff. And so that breathing was, was, was occurring going on. And on March 27th, the first time magmatic gases of, this, of the Russian period reached the surface, carried with it, bits of 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 of, of magma in forms of dust and so you saw this magmatic dust and you saw a really very big change from steam explosion to all of a sudden gases and had we sampled those gases like we do in kilauea we would have known what was boiling 
we you know, given if you see something like um, um, carbon dioxide or hydrogen sulfide or any of those sort of uh, or hydrogen hydrogen fluoride, um, you will you will be able to we know at what pressure temperature those are boiled, so we know how deep they came from, and we can tell what's happening, what's on its way. The speed at which the the mountain does its breathing of inflating, deflating these deflation inflation events, the speed which tells you how fast the magma chambers were going over. The reason why it's able to turn over again is because there's there's energy being fed in from beneath. So the speed at which the thing turns over tells you how much energy is coming into the system, how active it is. And, and I believe had we had the deflation, the, the tilt meters on, on the mountain, we would have seen it was turning over rapidly and that, that the amount of energy coming in from below was significant. Now, do you think that was just a limitation? Something's coming. Do you think that was a limitation of our understanding back 40 years ago? Do you think if that would have been something that was happening now, we would have had better predictive abilities? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yes, to some extent, but also we would certainly learn a lot from Mount St. Helens, but also the ability to have tilt meters on a mountain that's wriggling and raggling and, and so forth is, is difficult, right? The way that way the modern tilt meters work is do with, with microelectronics. And and then even if you had one of those things up there, because 1980 wasn't exactly the the uh, era of, of of large electronics, you know, of 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 of, of a large scale integration. Um, even if you could, the next question was how to get information from it. And so the telemetry is also a problem. We didn't have the Internet of Things. We didn't have cellular towers and Wi-Fi and GPS and these other things that were there. Could make now, were, were you now. interested in volcanology back back then? I mean, I I don't even know how I don't know how the story goes of how you, you went from math and prime numbers and that kind of stuff to to, to volcanology. At, at a very early age, I was interested in volcanoes, and that was because of Lassen National Park and Lassen Peak. Prior to Mount St. Helens, Mount Lassen and the great hot blast of May 22nd, 1915, was the most significant eruption in the continental United States. And and National Volcanic National Park, there the there was is is it is it the National Volcanic National Park is full of all these volcanoes. Now they weren't erupting at the time, but they had hot springs, just like you might go to Yellowstone and mud pots and so forth. That was kind of cool, but also they had the devastation area where where a a hole opened the side of, of Mount Lassen and hot gases blew out and they had a mud flow and so forth. That turned out to be very significant and what probably kept me alive at, at Mount St. Helens because of the knowledge of what happened in Mount Lassen. But also you gotta remember is that as a as a kid, um, the National Park had these um, Native Americans that would come in and give talks. And remember, there's a lady who called herself um, Indian Annie. And this is a lady who actually saw and witnessed the, the, the 1915 Mount Lassen eruption. This is like 1965. And remember, Sassing listened to this lady talk about the mountain blowing up and great hot rocks pouring out of the mountain and this sort of thing was, I, I could see in 1960, it, it was only 45 years later, you could still see the effects of that thing, but here someone actually live it was 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 really fascinating. And then they had movies, even back in the park surface head in 1972, 1973, they had movies they would show what? The Kilauea eruption mm -hmm. and, and some of the events in, in, in Kilauea. Um, which is why when I go back there, I see some of those things like the great 1989 eruptions and 72 eruptions and 74. You know, I, I remember the footage that the Park Service would show of that, of the Mars, you know, lava fountains. Little did I know I would be there and see that well, sort of stuff. Why experience. is there such an extreme difference between like the way Mount St. Helens went up uh, as, a, as a huge explosion? Um, as opposed to like Kilo, uh, Kilimanjaro and, and Kilauea, whatever, the, in, in Hawaii, Kilauea. which the, um, the, those types of volcanoes seem to be very active, but they're very slow moving lava. They're very like lethargic. They don't get, they don't blow up the entire island. Like if this was, Matt, Matt St. Helens, if that would have been on Hawaii, Hawaii would have been vaporized. <laughs> yeah. 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 So excellent question. The, the, the answer is that, that the, the, there's a fundamental difference between volcanoes you typically see in the continents versus out in the oceanic plate. It's andesitic continental versus basaltic in, in Hawaii. Now, they're not pure. 
Uh, but but generally, the volcanoes in on the continent are have basically warmed over high amounts of silicon, high amounts of sulfur, high amounts of the stinky gases. Right? They're they're, they're stinky. They're smelly. They're pasty. The 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 the, the magma is a lot cooler. Um, the magma. Why is it cooler? Well, not only does it have all this heat sink of this giant continent, but also typically. The, the mantle material is reheating or rewarming or remelting continent type rocks as opposed to out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You have a very, very thin, the Pacific Ocean uh, crust is very thin and the mantle is very close, magma material is very close to the surface. So when, when, the, when the material comes out at a place like Hawaii in a hot spot, it's higher temperature, very low in sulfur, not pasty. It's very fluid. It flows very well. And you look at you look at Mauna Loa, and it's very very gentle slopes. You look at something like like a a, a Mount Rainier, or a Mount uh, Shasta, or so forth. It's the reason why it's peaky is because that magma comes up, and when the lava comes out, it retains its shape. It mostly builds this very thick viscous. So continent lower temperatures, more viscous. Higher sulfur, more stinky, more more um, thick. So when it does pop, it tends to be very cranky. Hawaiian volcanoes tend to be very high temperature, low sulfur, easy flowing. Now, this isn't to say that it happens because we actually found andesitic in this last end of the last Kilauea eruption, andesitic material coming out of Kilauea, which was surprising. And we've seen basaltic stuff happen, evidence of happening in continents. So it's not. One to one, but generally the volcanoes in continents tend to be cranky. Cranky volcanoes tend to go bang because they're pasty because they're lower temperature. Um, now, ironically, volcanoes in, in in Iceland are also cranky, but for a different reason. Um, you know, you know, it's 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 kind of weird. People don't recognize that there's a lot more craters out there than people recognize. I went I went to Google uh, a while back, Google Earth, and you can go down to these various fields. There's the Salton uh, Fields in, in California. There's 150 miles where I live. There's an Amboy Crater. It's called an Amboy Crater. Was a is a is a cylinder type. What do they call it? A cone. Um, uh, what do they call that type of cone? Um, cinder cone. Uh, cinder cone. Yeah, it's called a cinder cone. Yeah. And uh, it's actually got three. If you actually looked in the middle of it, uh, and it's only about 150 miles, 50 miles away. I mean, there are volcanic fields not that far. From me in near Imperial County, and I'm all the way in Riverside County. But we, we, there's, if you if you look on the Google map and you go to those those fields, you can actually see small cinder cones all over the place. Yes, it's trippy. Nevada is full of them. Nevada has full them. Of yeah, yeah. Now you understand that right now there are 27 erupting volcanoes going on right now. Isn't that pretty much normal though? Yeah. I mean, and we have you know fifty, sixty that are that are active or near active, right? Uh, if 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 you you know if you go to volcano discovery www.volcanodiscovery.com after this show, you'll see a map of the current actively erupting and and minor activity and unrest spots there. Um, yeah, the, the Earth is is pretty is the second most volcanically active uh, object we know in the universe. First one being Io, but yes, um, and 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 if you if you fly over places in in the Cascades, even back down in, in places like Nevada, you will see begin to see these cones and these these flows and so forth that that are, that are there. Yeah, I've if seen them; they're impressive. And 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 because the Earth is pretty geologically active still, um, not like not um, like Mount uh, Mars. If you look at theirs too, you can see a whole bunch of the yeah. around the the. You can see I, I've looked. It's the a lot of you can, you're like that's a crater, that's a crater, that's a crater, and they're not like, yeah. like meteor craters. These are you can tell they they have lava flows and stuff like that. Although yeah. if you look at uh, geo, if you look at uh, Google's Earth, you can find meteor craters as well. Yeah, I mean it, it, it is it is um, I mean, in 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 that sense, um, there's lots of of, of craters now. Interesting enough, by the way, craters on the moon. Before people like Shoemaker Libby under help us understand what a meteorite impact meteorite impact would look like. We thought that a lot of the craters on the moon were volcanic. Why? Because the Earth is full of them. We presume that the moon had a, had a similar way. But um, but I say that 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 places like um, you know um, you know Mount Shasta are are you know they're they're again called a stratovolcano, 
um, they are are active. Um, you know, active volcanoes. The last eruption in uh, Mount Shasta was 1786. Last eruption in of of Mount Rainier is in the 1800s, like 1840 or so forth. These are active volcanoes. How do we know they're active? Because we can we can now with tilt meters, with gas meters, with um, with with also with with uh, seismographs, we can we can tell where the epicenters are. We can tell, like in the case of Mount Rainier, has a very active magma chamber, um, and it is it is actually Mount Rainier is listed as one of the ten most dangerous volcanoes in the world. Yeah, because of its of its of its vicinity near Tacoma. Yeah, Rainier, Shasta, Medicine Lake, uh, Lassen, um, Salton, uh, Salton uh, Butts, I think they're called. Uh, a whole bunch of them are, are very active fields right now. We have a Super Chat, though. Uh, super Chat, uh, Kawasa, can we really predict eruptions better than the... Excuse me, can we really predict eruptions better these days? 21 people died on the White Island eruption just last December. Good point. But what do you want to talk about that, well, uh, Landon? Yes and yes and, 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 and no. Um, we have the technology now to not be as surprised as we should be from volcanic eruption. I mean, volcanoes don't sit there and just always go bang, right? There are precursors. There are, are events leading up to it. And in the case of, of the case of like of the two volcanoes that are most heavily monitored in the world, Kilauea and Island Hawaii and the Great Mauna Loa, um, we have tilt meters, gas meters, GPS meters, and and field observation and webcams all over the place. Um, and and we 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 we've seen multiple eruptions come in there, and we can see what the indicators are, and we can tell. Now, when it's about ready to break, it's hard to predict when. But we can say we're within weeks or days of a, of something coming forward. Mm -hmm. How did happen something like 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 White Island happen? Well, guess what? White Island is one of the was one of the uh, decadal volcanoes, one of the considered one of the top most dangerous volcanoes on the earth. But guess what? It does not have the seismic monitoring, the gas meter monitoring, the um, um, tilt meter and so forth that other volcanoes do. There are surprising, shocking volcanoes that are near, I mean, in, in, there, there are volcanoes near um, Mexico City and in, in, in volcanoes in, in South America and, and in New Zealand. That, that people go to regularly that are relatively unmonitored. The reason why people died was they weren't monitoring the volcano. Mm -hmm. Now, I had a very disturbing situation. Uh, I, I, end of last year, I, I did a, I did a, a, a stint of, of monitoring um, Mauna Loa in Hawaii, and then I flew to Seattle for, for the holidays. And in, and there, I wanted to sort of uh, meet with some of the state of, of Washington officials to say, hey, you know, we're doing some really good work in um, in Hawaii. Mount Rainier is not that well monitored, but we have the technology. We have the, now these these compact little sensors we could put a network over there. And I said, and and I, you know, we could even have like the University of Washington Mountaineering Club. I the mountain and plank these things down and start getting data from there. Why? Because if, if Mount Rainier becomes more active, we want to have the tails. We, we want to see the tails. We want to see the, the systems that, that are in place to begin to warn people. What was the general uh, response from the state of Washington? Well, if you did that, property values would be affected. If you did that and we knew something was coming, We'd have the risk of because you don't know, right? When mountain comes more active, it doesn't necessarily blow. I mean, the one that was in the Philippines that we that is also considered one of the most dangerous volcanoes had a couple of events, but fortunately, people pulled back. We didn't think it, it but it didn't go all the way to a, to a giant uh, eruption. Mount Rainier is equally as dangerous and probably one of the more dangerous volcanoes in the world, but it's not that well monitored. And the state of Washington people said. You know, if if it happened, we'd call it an act of God and so forth. If you came up and said it's getting more active and people started fleeing places like Tacoma, it would create it'd be, a, it'd be a, a panic, hardship. Right? Yeah, and hardship and people have to like like shelter in place and, and then we're in yeah. Anyway. <laughs> well, I mean yeah, I mean 
Look, anywhere you go, there's going to be a potential for disaster. I mean, I live in Southern California. Yeah. We have earthquakes. I mean, uh, and by the way, I mean, if we had one probably in L.A., it would it would be notable here, but it's not going to be catastrophic yeah. like in L.A. because of the you know higher big buildings and stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> to be a fun fact, though, I actually grew up with a guy. Uh, he's an engineer. Uh, his name's Henry, uh, and he actually has a company called Sly Plate Technologies. That he's the CEO and he's he helped to design these slide plates and he has the contract from Warren Buffett to go in and retrofit these um, these buildings. So when there's an earthquake, the slide plate yeah. takes the energy, so it yeah. just dissipates it. And uh, he's made very well for himself. Like I said, he was one of my best friends in uh, in, in school. He's a few years ahead of me, but uh, uh, he did really well for himself. I mean, <laughs> it's it's it certainly is something that I want to to I mean really want to try to get you know even though the states. Officials were sort of like, mm, right? I certainly want to work with the University of Washington and get Mount Rainier as heavily metered, metered as it is in in Hawaii. It would be now. Why do you say? Well, you understand that 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 you know that 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 it's not been that long since uh, you know uh, Mount Rainier had an eruption, mm -hmm. right? It's 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 it is it is a it is a very active volcano, and, and in fact, the the you know, and if you go up to the summit, you can actually get a a you you actually you know, go into the, the the there's actually a nice warm stuff where the where the gases are venting, um, and uh, it it actually has it has actually pretty um, you know pretty active stuff. It's 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 had eruptions. In the 1800s. Now that's part of the, that's uh, part of the same volcanic yes, system. It's all part of the same cascade uh, as, system, as, right? Uh, it's it's all cascade part of the same, same, okay. same set of stuff. So, yeah. so the forces that are feeding Mount Rainier are similar to Mount St. Helens, mm -hmm. um, and and so the 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 you know the the you because know, because we've had um. Mount, Mount Rainier had a volcanic eruptions between 1820 and 1854. I went to stuff as well in, in as late as 1894. So it is it is still a an active volcano. So, but 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 back in 1980, we didn't have the microelectronics, we didn't have the the telemetry capabilities, we didn't have the uh, set to do the, the stuff we were doing with, with Mount St. Helens is actually relatively crude. Um, we and and because of stuff developed in Hawaii, we're able to now know how to read the signs. And again, even with Hawaii, when when the Halima'o lava lake blew open, we had already pulled back people from that area for several weeks. We can't tell exactly. It's like saying, you know, the board, you can hear it creaking, 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 getting ready to break. You don't know exactly when it's going to bang, but you can tell it's about to break. Some of the things we do with, with volcanoes. So what do you think is more dangerous then? Something along the lines of Mount Rainier or um, uh, Helens again or Mount Shasta? Or do you think of like more of a caldera like Yellowstone? I, mean, I think, well, the Yellowstone caldera is, is a is a... Is a something that the History Channel uses when it wants to do sweep weeks um, to get people you know, excited. To get to go, oh, look! It, it, scientists say that Yellowstone is active, and blah blah blah. It might come I mean, up as a quarter centimeter rise. It had it had its big caldera collapse several hundred thousand years ago. Hmm. It had its last eruption about fifteen thousand years ago. If if Yellowstone Basin were going to become active again. We would see the signs of 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 stuff coming from the you know in the in the general region of the basin. And even then, with the first volcanic eruption, it would be a cinnacone type of thing. It would take literally tens of thousands of years before the basin were to expand and fill to the point where it could then collapse. Here's the fun thing: volcanoes are most dangerous not when they blow up, but when they fall in. And that's what happened at Mount St. Helens. It fell in. When the material falls into the lava and it ejects yeah. out. And and so the way the way that 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 Yellowstone will become a super volcano again is that that basin would have to fill up with lots of eruptions, and then the mag the magma would have to leave the chamber and the and the 
and the top had to collapse in before it had one of those super volcano things again. So, so we'll get thousands of years of, of tells before even um, Yellowstone gets to start going. Rainier is active now. It's an active volcano. Mm-hmm. It's having a magma chamber turn over. It it had its last, you know, its its last eruption that was visible was in 1894. But Rainier is very <laughs> has very little in the way of monitoring. Yeah, I used to I used to live in uh, Indio, California, which is not too far from Palm Springs. Um, you know the area. Um, and yeah. there's a, a hop, skip, and a drunk. A hop, skip, and a drunk, and I'm stone sober. Yeah. Hop, skip, and a jump. Uh, way there's a, there's a big lake there, huge, massive sea called the Salton Sea. Uh, it's a, pretty much a dead sea. It, it it formed long time ago from an, uh, an overflow event from some river. Sure, but it is active geologically speaking it's one it's on a fault there's a whole fault line that goes through there but um yep. there the the, uh, the salt and uh, butts system down there that is monitored and that yep. is something that's extremely active right now yeah I, I always worried about if i lived it because i lived in india i'm like okay i got i got i got a fault line that was about five miles from me then you know a couple more miles i've got this huge <laughs> lake that sits on top of an active volcano that if it went up it would be like okay i'm not surviving this yeah, um, yeah, but so you, you, try, you try not to think about it. So yes, and and the class says very nicely. These planetary zits are dangerous. Yes, and yes. So, it, so after the show, go to Wikipedia to look up decade volcanoes, D A C A D E volcanoes. You'll see the list of what's considered the sixteen most deadly volcanoes, and the only volcano in North America that's on the list is Rainier. Mauna Loa is there as well because of its potential thing. But the thing is that Mauna Loa is probably the only one that set. That has very significant. Well, um, Mount Rainier. I mean, Vesuvius is a little bit, Etna is a little bit, but even there, they run into problems. Yeah, Mount Rainier is a lot further away from me, so I'm not con- concerned about the ones <laughs> that are near me. But um, so, what, so if you had to have a probability, like if you were going to do like an actuary thing, um, how what probability would you assign like a yearly of the chances of blowing up, like point zero 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 seven or something? Well, I mean, um, Rainier's history. Current history shows that it's in a, it, it has eruptions about every goes in erupting period about every two hundred years. So well, that was the last one a couple hundred years ago. 18, it had an 1854 yeah. was its major volcanic period with some minor eruptions afterwards. So you're saying it's going to go up sometime soon, possibly. But but understand that that doesn't mean that that it runs like clockwork, right? right? Yeah, Although some average. some do run like clockwork. I mean, uh, Mauna Loa. Is is arguably the most one of the most active volcanoes in the world and hasn't erupted in 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 nearly thirty years. So, so so why um, is it like all this stuff that's supposed to like happen with probabilities like earthquakes and and because uh, California's waiting for the big one, uh, volcanoes are supposed to go up. You know, it's supposed, supposed to get all these comets that would that turn out to be nothing. Uh, and we and of all this stuff, Beetle, Beetlejuice was supposed to go up at dinner. You know, of all this stuff, and what we get out of it, we get yeah. a stupid pandemic. Yes, <laughs> but but it's but it's you know it's chaotic systems. Yeah, but, yeah, but I mean, yes. it's like I, I think actually we've been pretty fortunate, and I don't want any catastrophic yeah. events to happen. But they will eventually happen. It's a given. I mean, uh, you know, I, I mean, you have to be uh, uh, cognizant that the fact that we live in a very geologically matter of fact, it's surprising. It's surprising any of us survive. I mean, yeah. but you know, in my lifetime, we really haven't. I haven't really experienced too many cataclysmic events. Uh, like yes. I said, this, Mount yes. St. Helens was a huge one that really affected a lot of people. And ash went for thousands and thousands of miles. Yes, and and um, I say back to, finishing with Mount Rainier. We will go back to to Mount St. Helens. If you if you look up Mount Rainier in Wikipedia, you will see down in geology a hazard map. Look at the hazard map. You'll see red, orange, and yellow. Red, orange, and yellow are places where lahar has occurred. What's lahar? When you have a when you have a you have ice and you have fire, you get really bad combination. Water and magma doesn't mix well. In fact, it tends to be explosive. Mount Rainier, like Mount St. Helens, has lots of glaciers on it, or Mount St. Helens had. And, and when, 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 when volcanic material reaches the bottom of a glacier, it begins to melt. But it doesn't blow, can't blow up through the glacier. It basically, you end up with a, a superheated pocket of, 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 of hot water well past the boiling point under pressure, that water works its way down to the base of the glacier and then pops out with a violent rush, rush 
of, of ash and superheated water that then roars down the mountain. And so you have this, you basically, you're, you're melting the bottom of the glacier, you get this pocket of superheated water that works its way down to the bottom where the glacier becomes thin, it pops out and roars down. So when you see in the Mount Rainier Wikipedia page under geology of hazard map and click on that, you'll see the red, which is the direct avalanche, and the orange, which shows you where the Lahar flows. These are flows that we can geologically measure in the last thousand years. They've had significant rushes of material, not just flood. We're talking about superheated, hot ash, rock, and so forth. And you look, it goes through right through Powallop and Tacoma. Um, you know, if, if we were sane, we wouldn't let people build there. We wouldn't let people live there. It'd be a parkland. We'd keep people away from it. But instead, we don't, right? Well, there's Just the same thing, like, same thing like Florida and Oklahoma. There's a whole bunch of places that you're taking your chances. I mean, we know the Hayward Falls is, 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 is probably one of the most dangerous faults in the Bay Area, where it's capable of a magnitude 8 plus earthquake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet we allow people to build right on top of the fault, right? So in some ways, when the Hayward Fault blows and we get great devastation in places like, you know, Hayward, San Lorenzo, San, you know, San Lorenzo uh, and, and Elkland and Berkeley and so forth. Well, anyway, let's, let's go back to Mount St. Holmes. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're moving from uh, uh, volcanoes to earthquakes, which, by the way, yeah. I, 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 that's a great subject, too, one of these. And I like to be able to, like, revisit this and come back yeah. and talk about the Hayward Fault and talk about the San Andreas and talk about, uh, oh, my God, these fault lines up here are crazy, man. They're, they're just, I'm really surprised we don't have more activity. Uh, but I, when I, when I, I, I feel earthquakes all the time. And it's like, the other, I, just, I know it's a sidetrack, but the last one we just had was, like, I, like last month, and I even posted it on my Twitter. And I yeah. was like, I, I called it. I was like, dude, this had to be about a 4.8, 4.9, 5.0, something like that. Yeah. Boom. It was like, and I was like, you know, I, I knew it had to be like within an hour distance. I knew it had to be like yeah. 10. You, could, you just get used to it. And sure enough, it was just like, you know, yeah. half hour away from me, so, you know. So Fisherman Mount Rainier, you know, it, it that current cone that you see formed the last 500,000 years. Mm -hmm. And the last major collapse occurred about 5,000 years ago, last sort of Mount St. Helen-like thing that occurred in, in Rainier 5,000 years ago. We've had, um, you know, ash from uh, the summit um, falls a 1,000 years ago. We've had 11 uh, helicene uh, layers have been detected. So it's, it's, it's coming. But back to, back mm -hmm. to Mount St. Helen. Mm -hmm. so, so we had the ash event, the telltale sign, that it wasn't just a bunch of steam coming up, but magma was reaching there in, in March 27th. I got to get out my my physics midterm, which I think I I think I would have done pretty well. I might not have aced if I'd done pretty well, but but we were excused. Um, um think of it like a pandemic, but 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 for more exciting reasons. And and so it gave us a really good chance of of doing field studies. One of the things that we did uh, was that we made, we wanted to see this, whether the mountain was expanding. We saw that the epicenters were rising up inside. In fact, by the time the March 27th first ash event occurred, the epicenters were at the base of the mountain, actually entering inside the mountain, right? The, the earthquakes were, were rising to a point where they're coming inside the mountain. And so we wanted to see what was the shape of the mountain? What was the size? And so um, we used um, we used lasers bouncing off the corner reflectors. That sounds really, really, really sophisticated, but, but generally it was this. You know, if you've ever seen an, a, a truck that's been pulled off to the side, you know, because of some emergency stop, and they have those little red triangles behind it, mm -hmm. they say, don't, please don't run into me type yeah. of thing. Um, well, we basically bought a whole bunch of those triangle ret retro reflectors. In McMinnville, where Linfield College was, was a, uh, was a, is a uh, place called Evergreen Helicopters. Look what I like about Evergreen. They have an interesting past. They do lots of interesting stuff, but in particular, they have helicopter pilots that have no fear. These are folks that, that, that you, know, you know, flew in Vietnam, flew in Korea, uh, and so forth, and, and those folks have, as the guy says, we have balls of steel, and they really did some amazing stuff. But but what we would do 
was that when um, we were we would we'd go up and do samples when when mountain towns would have a minor explosion, then you know and the duff would settle. Then we go up there and and pick stuff up because that was the safest part, right? It was very unlikely you'd have two explosions side by side. It had to build up pressure before it went poof again. Mm -hmm. And we also dropped on the top of the mountain corner reflectors. And we, for the base, we would then shoot a laser beam up and bounce off the mirror and come back. And we measure the time of the bounce and the back. We'd be able to get a, a very accurate distance. That could tell us what the shape of the mountain was and whether it was changing. Mm -hmm. Again, we didn't have GPSs to do that. It was the best thing you, you mean, could so, do. So if it was like expanding out, if it was bulging or anything, you'd be able to tell you? Yes. Okay. And 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 early as 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 um, late March, early April, we saw that the the peak area was bulging out at a rate of about one meter a day, so it's about three feet a day. Um, that's about a a what, a little over an inch and a half an hour for those that are metrically challenged, and and that told us. We expected that because we expected the, the magnets work its way up through. We expect the mountain to be expanding. Um, the next thing we did is we made use of through NASA for the Air Force. Um, the Air Force was operating U-2 planes. These two planes had really advanced infrared cameras. Why did U-2 planes have infrared cameras? Well, there was a country up on the other side of the of the pole that we were interested in. Called Russia, what doing <laughs> yes, and and so um, the kind of thing we got through NASA was that hey, you know, if you're flying up there to do stuff, could you just fly over Mount St. Helens and take some pictures and let us know what you see? And sure enough, pictures came back, nice hot spot towards the summer crater, which would begin to open up the crater because the thing explosion was getting wider and wider. But we could see hot spots there, telling that there definitely was also energy. I mean, through there. Well, the 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 laser range finders we did showed that the mountain was expanding. Then, then what happened was towards uh, the towards the end of April, um, a couple of things happened. Now, understand that, that that the mountain had eruptions, had 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 earthquakes and steam eruptions for a while, and the area particularly north of the the um, the Forest Service areas was closed. Because of danger, and we had a bunch of people complaining, saying, "Well, you know, we some people live up there; they're being forced to stay in their home and become fined." Uh, we were recommending that people um, um, stock um, masks in case there was an eruption with ash, and people were complaining about that and on and on and and the government is a hoax and and a conspiracy and da da da. Line. Does this sound familiar? And and by the end of April. The mountain went quiet. Instead of these twice a day type steam events and then ash events, the mountain stopped. And people said, Well, is it done? Can't we go back? Mountain's not erupting anymore. What's what's going on? Hey, how come you're keeping us away? Are you trying to take over this thing and, and take away our land and the whole conspiratorial thing that we always went into, right? Yeah. yeah, thank goodness we didn't have the Bundys and idiots like that there. But but there were some people that were kind of in that Bundish like like thing. Um, now we there were roadblocks getting up in the area. That was mainly to keep tourists out. But we knew the mountain people knew them passes and they would go around it anyway. But at least we told tried to tell them, hey, it's dangerous. When the mountain went quiet, as as in you no know, explosion at the top. We knew it was still active because there were still earthquakes happening, still harmonic crimbers happening. When, when the next time we could get a U-2 plane to fly over and take pictures at the beginning of May, the hot spot had largely disappeared from the summit and had appeared instead on the side of a place that's, called Goat Rocks. That's the one it blew out from? Yes, that ended up where we were blowing out from. And I have to understand that 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 we were mostly focused on the summit, but all of a sudden the side had a hot spot. So immediately we went up there and sprinkled corner reflectors around the goat rocks region on the side and started measuring that. And instead of it moving about 
um, a, a meter, about three feet a day, we started seeing several meters a day. By the time it got to the point where it was May 14th, the last measurement that I was willing to do, um, we saw the goat rocks moving at a rate of two meters an hour. That's uh, over uh, six feet an hour. Is right? that what you said? I'm out of here. Out. I'm done. See you. Peace out. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it was, it was pretty clear. Now, what, what we know now, what happened was the magma uh, in, in uh, Mount St. Helens had, was a fairly symmetrical cone. It looked like a, like a, a, a 3D bell curve. It was very known for this symmetry, its beauty. It had a little bit of bump on the side lower down. That was goat rocks. What happened was the magma chamber had worked its way up deep inside the mountain. Even though that, that Mount St. Helens had a lot of these flows that come to the top and the lava would go over on the side and coat this thing to build this nice little nice little cone, um, it had in the central, central part inside was a plug, a large, deep, um, and it's like a rock block. When the magma reached the bottom of that plug, it 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 forced its way into the cracks. That plug had been the channels where the gases uh, came up through and poofed to the top. When the magma hit the bottom of the plug, it froze. The plug was was a, was a big heat sink, and so the magma reached the bottom of that spot, started pushing its way into the cracks of the of the of the plug. Heat from the plug caused the, the magma to freeze. That sealed off the pressure. That's why Mount St. Helens stopped having the, the eruptions at the top. But, but understand the magma had already re reached a low enough pressure that all kinds of gases were coming in solution. The, the, you had a gas bubble that was building up inside. And it was building up more and more and more and more and more and more. It couldn't work its way up through the crack of the, of the plug. So what did it do? It started going to the side and pushing to the side. And that's where Goat Rocks was probably the weak spot on the side. Why? Because it was a place that, that several thousand years ago had some volcanic eruptions. So it's like a side vent. Mm -hmm. And so that was a weak spot where it began to push out. And, and by the time we saw, you know, I remember taking the, the measurement, the distance measurement, being surprised at how close it was I mean, in terms of, of, of meters. And, and and the measuring you do the laser beam, you calculate, you do the timing, you check the timing, you do your calculations and say, oh, it's this far. Well, that seems to be pretty, that's closer than what we expect. Are we in the right spot? Let's do the measurement again. So 10 minutes later, we did the measurement again, and, and it had moved. We did, I said, well, maybe the first measurement was wrong. Let's do the measurement again. It had moved yet again, 10 minutes. So by the time we took these things an hour, the, 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 the ghost rock had moved twice as far as the summit had been moving up. And how many days later did it blow up then? Three days later. Three days later, because it was the 14th. Yeah. Okay, so, oh, so this would have been about the 15th. Days. Okay, uh, so there's yeah. a couple of things, a couple of takeaways. One, uh, Blunt, sure. uh, Blunt, uh, Blunt, Sla Blunt Slaughter, I can't pronounce his name, became a Patreon. Thank you for that. I did notice. Um, I always thank, thank you for Thank you, thank you, thank you. Blunt Slaughter. Blood solder. Blood solder. I can't, I've never been on his name. I know where he is. I just never pronounced his Thank name. Thank you right. very much for becoming a patron. Blood solder. Yeah, we're gonna call him that. Blood solder. Blood yeah. solder. I'm I'm a patron too. So so thank yes, you very much for joining. a huge Patreon. Uh, yeah. uh, and so the, so the rule of thumb is this. This is the take. This is a good takeaway. If you see Landon Kurt Noll running in, in some particular direction, <laughs> follow him. Just go with it. Doesn't matter what yeah. it is. It does. If you see him hauling ass, just you're you get get out of there. Right? Is that a good rule of thumb? Yes. Okay. I was probably the thing that when we back our way. And of course, my advisor was saying, "Wow, we need to report this, and we're not coming back. And 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 we should, by the way, over in in the cold water area, we should actually, you know, check to to see and and let those people know because there are, we weren't the only geologist geology people up there. We were a bunch of college kids, but but um, you know, the the Mount St. Helens had it had a, certainly a a collection of USGS people there." Um, working on the work on the mountain, um, around the mountain at, at the at the time, and um, you know the thing that 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 happened, you know again, you know Mount Helens have been dormant since the 1840s, 1850s, but this was a you know this was a whole new new event. So we we I remember we went by the 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 area of of um, it was it was it was it was an area that the geologists were working on, um, 
and and we presented the information we had to them, um, saying, you know, by the way, we just we just saw how fast that area is moving. Uh, you know, we think something bad is going to happen, and in fact, um, the there there was there were several people in that area that we went to and said, hey, you know, um, uh, we think something significant is going to happen, and in fact, there's an area called Coldwater. There was a there was a lake there called Cold Water, but where we talked to these people, and I remember what we presented was, "Hey, we think Mount St. Helens is about to happen due to Mount Saint, Mount Lassen. We expect, given it's on the side, just like Mount Lassen did, the Great Hot Blast created a devastating area with with. I said, furthermore, Mount St. Helens has these glaciers on top of it, the Lahars." The, the 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 volcanic blast potential was was significant, and I remember we convinced the people who were monitoring there all but one person to to leave. Um, our you know, and he said you can check our data. You don't have to believe us. You can check data to the lane running right. And this one particular geologist was saying like, well, I'm staying here because. I want to collect the data, and I want to, you know, I want to race to publish. I want to be the first first version to publish data from the eruption. I was like, but you don't understand, you know. And he said, well, but you've got this lake in front of me, no problem. Like, oh, and I, I remember my argument was, well, if we've seen from other eruptions, like in the Philippines, when a blast comes down and hits a lake, the lake turns into steam, and basically it it acts like a hockey puck and just the thing just goes across the lake like it's not there. It transfers the, the material there. And and so uh, what you'll hear is like, um, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, we, we, we knew of other people who were there uh, from source for people that were saying, you know, like we heard from the radio. I remember hearing the radio, somebody saying, damn, it's going to get me too. And then go silent, right? Uh, we didn't hear the thing about Columbia, Columbia. This is the this is it, but this is the main event. Um, but again, what happened? What we know now was that there was a magnitude five earthquake because the side of the mountain that was that was in the area of Growth Rock cracked and began to slide down. And the largest landslides in in history of the side of the mountain falling down, but but it wasn't didn't simply stop at a, a giant avalanche, because underneath that was a magma chamber under high pressure. When it pushed the, the mountain away, and, you, and if you watch some of the photos and some of the things of, of the eruption, you'll see the stuff coming out down the bottom. And you see the thing start to collapse on the side, and then you see this stuff come up. What's happening is this. The side got pushed out. The, the pressure got were you know lowered on the magma chamber. The magma chamber got basically got exposed. And all of a sudden, this 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 liquid rock with these liquefied gases, you all of a sudden release the pressure and it begins to fall. Just like you took a, a a can of coke and stuck it up and then ripped off the top, you get this big foam coming out. That's necessarily what what Mount St. Helens did. So so the the when it begins to slide, the magma chamber pushed on it violently, dejected. And then what happened was you had that plug. Remember, the plug at the top of the, of the thing is no longer supported by something. It, it, falls it down. plunged in. The top plunged in. Plunged into what? It plunged into the magma. And the magma goes out, right? Now, it's not, you don't see it as this giant red lava stuff. You see it as, as a bunch of black stuff. Why? Because you see the, the, the material is, the, the rock is boiling away. The gases are boiling away violently. And and so it started. I mean, the, the we know that the, the magma started coming out, and the blast started coming out at a rate of around 200 kilometers an hour. By the time the, the thing plunged in and the main cork got took off, the material was coming out at around a thousand kilometers an hour, near this you know speed of sound. It hit Spirit Lake, boils Spirit Lake, and went across Spirit Lake at the state of speed of sound. The people on the other side. Didn't stand a chance, right? They were, they were, they were, they were. Um, I don't know if they, if they killed them by 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 temperature, by pressure, or 
or by rocks flying at them, but but they were sort of killed, uh, you know, killed instantly. So we instead were not to the north. In fact, we decided that being in the north is dangerous. We knew that the north and northwest were where the bulge was occurring. We expected a Mount Lassen type blast. We didn't expect it to be as violent as it did. We didn't expect it to be as catastrophic to the thing because Mount Lassen had a blow with holes inside, but but the mountain stayed relatively intact. In case of Mount St. Helens, it 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 took the, the side out, the, the top plunged in, the magma chamber went splash. So so nearly you had nearly a cubic kilometer of magma all of a sudden had its pressure release, and you had all this stuff turned into ash. And but we were to the south, kind of south southwest, um, or or actually west southwest of Mount St. Helens. We had moved there for several reasons. One was the jet stream was coming from our back, so the jet stream was coming was 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 moving from the southwest to the northeast. We also went behind a ridge or behind a mini ridge, so we were actually were not in visible sight of Mount St. Helens. We also had gas masks. We had asbestos suits, we had food and rations, we had radio communication, we had a number of safety equipment. Why the people up in front on the north side, even if they thought they could get away with it, weren't protected, I don't know. But they weren't. Um, we, can't so, even, we can't even get people to wear a mask. They can balk at that. You think they're going to go in and wear like a business suits and ventilators? Come on. <laughs> Please. And, and it, it is... It is ironic. I mean, if if you if you see me today on the street in a you know in in a you know it, with, with my mask on, I use the mask that I use when I go to Kilauea volcano. Why? Because that thing eliminates you know sub micron sized ash particulates and yeah, it's a whole nine yards. And right? as well as and as well as gases or things. So yeah. so I'll, I'll show you there. This is what this is what my gas mask looks like. This is a yep. volcanic mask. And that's what I wear out in the street. In in, in the street there, um, that's what I was wearing. This sort of thing, a bit overkill, but yeah. <laughs> but it it works, right? Yeah. Um, so the morning we didn't know when it was going to blow, but we knew that 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 the side of the mountain couldn't be moving two meters an hour. At some point, something was going to give. We didn't want to be in front of the cannon. Again, it was on the side. It was not on the top. If it had been on the top, we were worried about stuff going out. All over the place, but this was on the side to the north and northwest. So we went to the southeast. The 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 jet stream is from our back. We were behind a ridge, behind another ridge, so we couldn't even see the 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 the, the mountain unless we went up to the top. Um, so on the morning of the 18th, again, we were there for we planning to camp out there for a week or so, two weeks. I was worried because finals was at the end of 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 May and and so I remember taking my stuff up to sort of study for the finals and thinking, what if I went to the finals and the eruption blows while I'm taking the finals? Right? <laughs> How do I do this? Stuff? But uh, the morning of the 18th, 8:32 um, in the morning, there was an earthquake, and and um, when I experience an earthquake, I pay attention. I mean, earthquake, yeah. earthquakes can be very instructive experiences. So when my my experience in an earthquake is I don't panic, I begin to watch. I begin to I wait because, for example, you could tell how far the epicenter is. You get first these P waves. You get the the the, the, the ground start going blah, 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 and all of a sudden you get this wham. And you get the big seesawing back and forth thing, right? That's the S wave. So the P waves are the da, 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 and then the big wham comes and hits. And then you start seesawing back and forth. The every second between the, the da, 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 and the wham is eight kilometers or five miles to the epicenter. So if you have an epicenter that's two, that is two seconds away, two seconds between the P and S wave, you know that it's 16 kilometers or 10 miles away. It's kind of like the lightning and thunder thing. This one was a fairly quick da, 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 bang, right? Um, it was a it was a it was a it was a very significant earthquake around magnitude of five. But unlike an earthquake, there was the sound. And 
that's the thing that 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 you can see pictures of volcanoes. I've shown pictures of Hawaiian volcanoes. We'll do a we'll do a Hawaii lava stuff. We'll show you a good mm -hmm. picture of it. What I can't convey to you is the sound. The sound of erupting volcano is absolutely incredible. There's no way that your home theater system can is, give is it you terrifying? that. Distance. It is amazing. The best, the best I can say is that 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 you know Feynman said, you know, he described when he described the Trinity blast. He said, yeah. I also there was another gentleman that was with our group that had seen a Saturn V rocket launch, and had the same thing. You felt the 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 sound inside your chest. Mm -hmm. We know now from Sonic. This is back to sound and music stuff. We know from from sonic analysis in Kilauea, that that one of the predominant frequencies we saw in Kilauea is between, depending on where it is, between 8 and, and, and 14 hertz, subsonic, but extremely loud. What you can hear a little bit is the overtones, the, 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 the sort of the minor sort of overtones of the higher frequencies getting into your low, that low roar is the overtones, the, 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 the much, much more diminished harmonics. But but you can feel inside the, the sound. Um, um, it's like your bones are, are are being pushed inside your chest. Um, I guess if you've been to a rock concert. Like people talk about being at the Who or Pantera rock concert, and 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 experiencing the the, the sound inside you, um, or a shuttle launch. That's the thing that 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 sound is. Just incredible. You, you. The reason why you're never going to get it out of a, a bunch of speakers on a stage is we. You had a mountain-sized subwoofer going on. We had a blast of 32 megatons, or excuse me, 26 megatons. Sorry, 26 is reason. We originally thought it was 32, but we scaled down to 26. 26 megaton blast that occurred, and the sound waves on the backside of the mountain. You could feel it in your chest. We had a um, they had a recording barometer. It was a it was one of these things that 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 spun around. It was a clock mixing and spun around once a week, and the barometer would record the as and flows of, of the fronts going through. That recording barometer showed at thirty inches of mercury was the normal, a half inch above and below. That 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 that, that, that it was enough pressure that the recording barometer rose a half inch and dropped one inch and came back to half inch. As that shock wave went through, and this is the backside of the mountain from from this thing. Um, you know, people talk about you know very far away hearing the sound of cannons roared. Well, actually, up front, that sound was just inside your chest, and 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 it didn't stop. It just wasn't just the bang pop like a firecracker. I understand that that that, that what happened was that, that the top of the magma chamber gets exposed. It begins to foam. It the foam bubbles push down on the magma. It stops it from 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 um, outgassing momentarily, and then it comes up, it rebounds, and then blows again. So this this several hours, this magma chamber was was took several hours to basically defoam, and and this was the result. You get to, you get to this, this ash right that that is there. If you look into this ash in a microscope, what you would see is is look like little bits of look like rock bubbles, little partial stuff you could see inside a very uh, a very smooth surface and it and 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 what looked like what originally was a a a bubble of rock that got cracked mm -hmm. it's one reason why this this powder is very abrasive right when you when you put it through your fingers it really actually i mean you can you can rub you know you know uh, uh paint off of stuff it has a grit because to it. it has it has a very very sharp grit this is this is silicate um, it's it's actually not really good to breathe because you know silicosis. I mean, this is a good way to do it. And again, you look at this stuff here, and you see you can see how much see how much gas stuff gets pushed around there. I mean, just break it like that. That, and if I open it up, you would get dust all over this place. It would because it would just it just just flies over and settles. Um, it's quite insidious, and and you know sleeping on this stuff. It it. it Imagine sleeping in sandpaper. There's no way you can keep it out of your tent, out of your sleeping bag. It was very uncomfortable. But we didn't stay there for long, right? When when the 
But the purpose of the of us being there is to collect those early samples of ash. And we took them to a, a reactor, a nuclear reactor called at Reed College. It's an open water reactor. Beautiful reactor, right? Because when they turn it on, you can see the shrink off radiation. You see that 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 wonderful blue glow. Mm -hmm. It is just it's 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 I so mean, you, you can stand over and you can see the fuel rods or, or... Oh, yeah. It, it, it's very, 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 very cool. And not like the ones that, that the same ones do where they're inside a special chamber. You can't see the glow. It, it really does this, 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 this wonderful glow. Mm -hmm. Why was the reactor there? Well, what we want to do is called neutron activation analysis. We're going to take the, the ash that we had, put it into the reactor, expose it to neutrons, to radiate it, and then bring it back up and look at the gamma spectrum, the gamma rays are coming off of it. That would tell us not only what material, what elements were there, but uh, ice scopes were there. We wanted to see, was the stuff coming out of Mount St. Helens kind of like, you know, antacidic? Was it, was it mantle-like, basaltic, or what was, what was there? What was coming out? What was the new material like? Answer was, it was, it was antacidic. It was basically, it was, it was a warmed over bit of, of continental stuff going foosh. Um, but it was the case, so I came back with the first group. In fact, this, this particular material, we, we um, up near the, the up near the volcano had a lot of coarse ash and then fine ash, and so this material we took. I mean, you just it was coming down in buckets full, right? And so um, although we weren't being dusted as much as the people on the side that, that they're having, you know, literally filled with with meters of this stuff, we had a sort of fine ash falling down, drifting down, just like you you got with the mm -hmm. oh, in, yeah, in school. It was, it was quite a bit actually. And yeah. and so we we collected it off, and we we went through. Uh, we we took. We had basically had a sorter. We basically had these various layers of, of of meshes where we could we could check it all through to get the 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 large blocks in one large pieces in one piece, middle mean size pieces, the smaller pieces, finer and finer. This was the bottom of the of the barrel, right? Where where we had extracted out the big pieces because we want to analyze the big chunks, the medium chunks, and the small chunks. To see what was what was happening, and so we went. These were not this dust, but but the other dust was put into the reactor and, and cooked. Basically, there, there was a there was a portal. We can put us. You can you can slide a, a vest vial down in it. It went in sort of this this tray that went through the reactor and back out. You cycle it through several times and bring it up. You put in a gamma ray spectrometer and measure the gamma rays. Yeah, um, there's, there's 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 a specific neutron flux density that goes through the core. Um, and yes. that's one, one for even burning. And two, somebody asked what Chen Yinkov radiation was. Uh, Chen Yinkov radiation is basically when you have a when you have a particles moving faster the, than the speed of light in a medium because the light will be actually slowed down, which technically is not what it's doing. But pro all practical purposes, yes. light is a little bit slower than its normal in a vacuum speed. And you have charged particles going through that medium. It's going to produce this really weird bluish type glow. That's Kyle. It's, mm. That's Chen Yinkov radiation. Yeah. And, and we had several runs of that. I mean, I, I came back and it was helped probably in the neutron analysis of stuff. Other people runs came through um, there. I, I have to say um, that that the normal protocols of putting something in a reactor and pulling it out were kind of, they were kind of, uh, I should say, bypassed. The safety officer knew this was an emergency, knew we needed to get this stuff in. And quickly, you know, as, as stuff was coming out, we were going to see if there were any changes yeah. as Michelle was coming out of, of Mount St. Helens. Um, and in addition to putting in ash, you put in other tracer materials. So you put in um, uh, materials like 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 uh, silicon and phosphorus and other tracings. Where why? Because you want them you want them cooked equally as well, and then measure how radioactive they are, so you can calibrate the the radiation dose that you have in your ash. Well, yeah, because I mean they're they're going to have potassium. What is it? Potassium thirty nine, argon forty. You're going to have. Yep those kind of radionucleotides in the, in, in the yeah. or any kind of flow like yeah. that, right? Yeah. And so, but you also put in your, your sample materials, they're not ash. Mm -hmm. And then you're able to see how hot they come out after being radiated. Um, and so we can put in various sample of materials and that's where, that's where I, 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 I had some U-238 depleted uranium. And I said, well, let's put this sample. That's a legitimate sample of material. And came back up and said, oh, look, Neptonium, plutonium, right? Now, we're talking about picograms 
but it, it did after a while cook stuff. And so I could, I can claim I, I made a little bit of plutonium, but, 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 but picograms, even though if the nuclear regulatory commission knew about it, I did have my ass, but Hey, don't ask, don't, don't, don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> right? yes. yes. But, 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 um, the, the, the thing that, so other things about the, so it's one thing about the mountain. So the sound is there. Another thing was, I remember was the lightning. The, the ejection of magma in that ash cloud generated tremendous amounts of static electricity. The, the, the friction and the boiling generated tremendous amount of charges. And what we were seeing was from the side of the mountain, about halfway up, you get these lightning bolts. It would start from the side of the mountain, go up into the cloud and flash. And, and the times they were, were like two to three a minute of these, of these lightning bolts coming off the side up into the mountain when they would flash inside the what it was well otherwise it would be a this this you see these pictures of these black things when they would flash inside briefly it would illuminate inside the cloud and you see you could see the, the sort of convection stuff inside the cloud as these lightning bolts would go off inside there um mm -hmm. and it, that was another thing that was that was quite striking it was hard to lightning is notorious to photograph but it was really hard to, to image that stuff, but you could tell when it would be these free, brief illuminations because it was really was a, a very stark contrast between daylight and clear air, the ash cloud and the wind blowing and, and deep stuff. And it would arc up to that ash cloud because it was generating charges. And, but it was lightning not, as you see, from the top of the clouds coming down to the mountain, down, down the ground and forking out. It was coming from the ground up into the ash cloud and going bang, bang, bang inside that was really quite uh, quite amazing um you know there was certainly some tragedy the loss of life uh some people that that died that stuff could have been prevented if they'd listened or they took things seriously um there's a, again an ironic thing about about you know it, it, it's ironic that i'm 40 years later putting on a mask but for different reasons and having people protest stuff. There are certainly people up there protesting, saying, you know, uh, government's telling us what to do and keeping us away from home. They want to take away our land and so forth. Well, you know, when that thing, when that thing blew, it, it really cleared out. I mean, it did almost a billion dollars in damage in that area. Um, it, it, it blew down Virgin Forest. I mean, it, it leveled um, an area that, that, that was... It was here. In fact, I remember very shortly after the ash cloud stopped, we took a helicopter ride over it. And I remember that what was beautiful Spirit Lake was now full of, really full of, of driftwood, of, of, of logs. What was once trees were now stumps of trees. I mean, the, the, the blast had basically ripped up these virgin forest trees, thrown into the lake, and the lake was almost completely covered with logs. And we flew over... I remember we, we flew over an area in cold water. We saw what was a Volvo in the in the ash. And you know, you looked at that. I mean, the the, the there was not a window in there. I mean, it, it had been scoured and burned. Um, the inside was 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 essentially completely torched. And you know, there was no way anyone could have survived that um, that blast. I remember I remember that that seeing that Volvo sitting in the ash and thinking, damn. Um. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, like I said, I, we were far enough away where we only had to worry about the respiratory aspects of the ash, because as you said, it's a silicon, and, and we had to take. Uh, I don't remember. I remember I had to take some kind of precautions, but it wasn't like we had a. I, I think I had a handkerchief or something over my mouth if I remember correctly. Red handkerchief. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. But um, uh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just say uh, we are coming about the ninety minute mark. Um, probably gonna like. But yeah, remember, the ash was very difficult bit. to clean because, first of all, you try to brush off your car, you basically sandpaper your your yeah your, yeah, and if you, your, and you when you plane. when you get it wet, it turns into like this this like gritty mud stuff. Yeah, because the, the water causes this thing to congeal, and you get to this 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 this, this almost this hardened paste. Um, your air filters, um, probably in driving around and stuff, is your car air filters would plug up very quickly, yeah, and you couldn't you know. Wasn't very good, and of course, getting that stuff in your carburetor and on your pistons, grinding away, you lose just your wearing, wearing all your mechanisms down. Yeah, just destroy it, everything. It was, 
nasty stuff. Now, the, the helicopter pilots people, part of their thing was well, that they keep the blades rolling. So one of the things in particular is that they would keep the, the blades revving at high rev, try to keep the air going. They try not to land in too dusty of an area. They would, they, when they come down, they had kind to of blow the dust away, try to push it off to minimize the amount of dust because that's one thing you don't want to get into airplane, you know, helicopter rotors is, is, is abrasives. But they did a marvelous job. Um, you know, the, 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 there was a lunar month later in June 10th, another major eruption, not as explosive. And that didn't have the explosive blast that the, that the, that the June, that the May 18th did. But the, the crust of the, of the magma had sort of crusted over and created a solid spot that capped it in. And then the, it was actually literally the next lunar cycle where the moon's gravitational pull had, had, was, the, was the so-called straw that broke the, broke the camel's back. Uh, that and additional pressure that when next moon cycle came in, it broke in. Not that, that, that the moon causes eruptions, but when it's at the knife edge point, that little bit of push of the tidal push and can tip it over. So the June eruption was also very significant and had significant ash thing again. So we had, you know, but but again, you had ashes as far away as as Minnesota, up into places like you know Manitoba and Ontario. Um, it went down as far as Colorado. It went down into Oregon, Washington. It was a, it was a fairly sizable ash distribution that that occurred. And for several months, you had these major ash uh, events that occurred. It eventually wound its way down. I mean, um, it's, it, had its, it had several, um, you know, the July 22nd was another uh, eruption, August 7th, another one. Um, and, and its last sort of, its last really sort of major push was on January 3rd, 1981. Um, even then, the dome inside would begin to build again. And today, if you go there, there's a national monument. You can see the the plug inside the, the dome. There's a nice camera there if you don't want to go and visit. And you can see that dome inside building up. Um, so eventually, Mount St. Helens will will have the plug expand. It'll it'll probably overtake the the top and uh, you know, reform at some point, and it'll blow again. Next several thousand years. Yeah. So let me ask you this: uh, a good time to wrap it up. So, if, uh, for the people who want to do an experiment to make a, make a volcano, what what do you think the best way to make a volcano is? I like the 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 old uh, you know, uh, acid and flows like you know, Mentos and and, um, and you know what, you know what we used to you know. Um, by the way, do, do people actually do they know why that Mentos and Coke things work? Do, I wonder if they actually know the reason. I don't know. I don't know. My my followers know. Uh, should I just tell them, or do you think they know? We'll we'll see Does if they anyone... know. We'll see if they know. Tell tell me why the Mentos and Coke things work. Um, but yeah. what we used to do is, my 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 friend actually it's ironic because a friend that does a slide pick technology was mutual friends with this other guy that I knew, and his dad would bring home these big old blue barrels of hydrogen peroxide, and they were about thirty five percent solution. So this was not like your weak stuff that you buy at the store. This was concentrated. 35% H2O2. So the rest was like water, but H hydrogen peroxide. And then you would you would have these these cells that we got. And these cells would be dry cells. And they had a chemical one called magnetized dioxide. And when you mix magnetized dioxide with hydrogen peroxide, it just like the whole Mentos thing. Messy, but we were fascinated by this as kids. Just fascinated by that. But uh, so nobody so no uh, small holes in Mentos. Yes, Kawasa, that's actually correct. Um, the reason why Mentos works when you drop it into Coca-Cola is that the sugar in those Mentos, has the, the surface is very, very nook and cranny-like. And these form what's called nucleation points. Yes. So it, when you have a concentrated solution like um, like uh, Coke, it, it, it's, it, it's in the solution it has carbon dioxide, right? And that carbon dioxide wants to come out. And so what it will do is it will find what's called a nucleation point That'll allow the gas to escape. So all these living points, the carbon dioxide is, is coming out of solution all at once. That's what causes that whole rapid thing. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, in that's conclusion, a, he had a teacher. Somebody said they did a teacher with thermite. No, thermite is aluminum, and that's a whole yeah. different ball game. <laughs> that's an aluminum with rust. I don't stuff, but, but, but I, by yes. I can't. That's is that. Do we get in trouble by telling people chemical things? 
or might? I I mean, you probably don't. They'll, they'll, don't give don't, an, don't, don't, yeah. give an don't recommend it at home. But if I mean, like I said, if you want to take rust and aluminum, uh, never mind. <laughs> Filings. Um. So so you know the the concept itself is we had a you know an eruption where the top 400 meters of the mountain were blown off. That's about 1,300 feet. It destroyed over 600 kilometers, about 330 square miles. It spread ash as far as in Canada and many states. Um, it had you know the the, the Eruption blast accelerated up to about a thousand kilometers an hour. That's six hundred seventy miles per hour. It was it was five in the volcanic explosive in, in this index. Um, it it killed. Sadly, it killed uh, fifty. Uh, you know, at least you know fifty people or more. Um, destroyed. You know, many. It it it. So, but but the nice thing is the government set aside four hundred fifty square kilometers about about. 110,000 acres of West Nile, Mount St. Helens Volcanic National Monument. You go there and you can go to the visitor center and you can look at stuff. And if you don't want to go there, you can look one of the, 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 uh, I'll take the cam, cams. Right? Yeah, the cams. Yeah, definitely. On there uh, for, for stuff. Because nowadays it's, it's, you know, it's a, uh, to say, but it's, it's a, it's a mountain that is, that is, uh, uh, there, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a nice memorial there as well as 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 good pictures and 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 good uh, uh, um, you know information about the system. Um, it taught us a lot. I think it also taught the USGS about how to engage the public properly because because most of the time, like an earthquake, it happens you do the aftermath. This was something with that the train was coming. We could see it coming, and the inability to try to get killer people out was a sad thing to see. Certainly, some of the lessons learned, um, Hawaiians, uh, Native Hawaiians tend to be pretty smart when 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 they had the last end of, of Kilauea's uh, eruption in the very eastern part of the, of the island. Native Hawaiians cleared out mm. long before Pele came in and did his project and stuff. What I hope is that we can take the technology we have in monitoring Kilauea and Mauna Loa, and apply them to that decade, decade volcanoes. You can go up and go on to Wikipedia to look at decade volcanoes, and look at those dangerous things. Those are the spots that are they're dangerous because they're active volcanoes very near populated areas. And we'd hope people do that. We hope people to get more monitoring there and learn from this stuff. Um, because nowadays, with GPS, with tilt meters, with microelectronics, telemetry, we can we can blanket a volcano if we spend the time to do so. I, I, it's wise to honor these. And, and, and so Mount St. Helens is my top five volcanoes. Uh, Mount Lassen, Mount St. Helens, Kilauea, Mauna Loa, Mount Erebus. Those are my five favorite uh, volcanoes. And I've, I've indicated in my will that when I die and I'm cremated, I like a bit of my ash to be put into each of those volcanoes, because at some point I'll be launched in the stratosphere, because those volcanoes will erupt. You'll make it into space again. somehow. They will erupt again. All right. Well, we're going to leave that. Uh, this was fun. I like these little. This was kind of a spur of the moment thing. This wasn't even that planned, uh, and this came out really well. So I appreciate coming in and talking about it, Landon. Uh, we're we're going to do some more DEF CON 1 science, I promise. I also got. Uh, yes. Dr. Kroon coming in to do some DEF CON 1 science uh, as well. We want to do. A, math stuff we want to do general relativity special relativity uh have a total cool. operators to dell and you're more than welcome to, to i mean I one's that. your thing trust me i mean but you're not yeah. always available and, so and and, and the other thing you know, there's, but there's, there's more than one scientist out there and the other thing we want to look at is things like for example you know, talking about the the age of the universe and how we measure i don't want to i don't want to deal with with young age stuff i talk about how do we know what we know about the age of the universe the size of the universe but that's also a fascinating yeah, yeah, we could, story. Well, he's an astrophysicist, so that would work out perfectly. Yeah. All right. All right, guys. Good night. Thanks for watching this, and we'll see you later. Stay safe.